Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Coral. Dr. Coral graduated from Harvard School of Dental Medicine in 1980 and is in private practice in Boulder, Colorado. He has been a member of the IAOMT since 1991 and is the chairman of the IAOMT Endodontic Committee. He also helped create our website, IAOMT.org, for the Academy. And please welcome Dr. Coral to the podium. Uh, the topic is uh, not usually very controversial outside these hallowed halls, but here it's pretty controversial. The search for a middle ground, uh, root canal therapy, you know, facial pain and stuff. There's a lot of facial pain patients, but there's 18 million root canal patients every single year. This is where the rubber hits the road in dentistry. And uh, uh, we know it's controversial, but most people don't. Um, in any case, the, uh, let's see, there we go. The prevailing view, 100% uncritical acceptance. Uh, you know, Johnny Carson said, oh, you don't want a root canal? I had a root canal, I said, everybody get a root canal. But many of our most principled and uh, most conscientious members, friends, colleagues, uh, biological dentists, are of the 100% rejection uh, path. And uh, there's some compelling historical reasons as to why that is and why we should uh, be concerned about whether we should be doing root canals. So I'm going to involve myself with two different questions today. One is, can you do better root canals? Can root canals be done in a more biological way? Uh, well, basically, can you do good root canals in an alternative way? And are root canals good? What is root canal? Now, usually at these meetings, there's more people who are not dentists. but. Aside from John Wilson, I don't see anybody who's not a dentist. Are there people who are not dentists? Uh, Leo, you know, you're, you're as good as a dentist. Well, so we all know what root canals are. I don't want to belabor the issue. I prepared a nice section. By the way, the internet is great. I want to gratefully acknowledge websites from all around the world from whom I've stolen some wonderful pictures. Uh, University of Connecticut and University of Oslo in particular for all this histology. Uh, the formation of a tooth. What is a root canal? Well, a tooth starts off as a bud, as a cap, a bell. We know this. This is dental school stuff. The, uh, the dental epithelium entraps the mesenchymal cells in here, and, and the, the mesenchymal cells become the pulp, as we know. Here's where the calcification starts. So interesting. Uh, the enamel organ to the outside, the dentin forming organ to the inside. It's always nice to go back and see these histological pictures because, you know, we work with these structures uh, through a little hole, through a rubber dam, and so forth. But um, this is really what we're we're working with. With the uh, uh, that's how many dentinal tubules there are in these in these teeth that we work on and um, pulp tissue the granular layer and the odontoblastic layer. Uh, there's that great picture of one cell per, odonto, per, per dentinal tubule. OK, well, we can go right through this and, because we don't have those uh, politicians and otherwise lay people who don't know what root canals are. Well, how do they get in trouble? And we know that, too. We're all dentists in this room today. Caries is the uh, primary disease which leads to trouble in the root canal. Caries. Here's an adult with caries that started in at the gum line between the teeth. Here's a okay. caries penetrating enamel spreading out in dentin, spreading down into the dentin. And uh, here's the bad boys actual visualization of bacterial cells penetrating dentin. Penetrating dentin and then over here is the beginning of an inflammatory lesion in the pulp well in advance. Well, you know this. Here's that same inflammatory lesion and you can actually see the bacterial cells getting in there and infl acute inflammation, 
chronic inflammation, pus, and then finally periapical lesions, which were, you know, that's bread and butter when you start talking about root canals. Uh, a tooth having had caries, bacteria entering the pulp chamber, destroying all the tissue, leaking out the end of the root and causing this inflammatory reaction in the bone. Okay. Dentistry 101 and 102. And of course, the answer to the problem is the root canal treatment. And this was also prepared for people who are not dentists, but uh, you know, you file out the root, um, clean it out, fill it up, and if um, in the ideal case, what happens is the problem goes away. And uh, you fill it up with these. And, and here's the new stuff, the uh, resin-based uh, gutta purchase purchase substitutes. This is Resilon, Epiphany, uh, uh, Endo-Res, stuff like that. Uh, all latest and greatest and gooder and newer. Uh, here's the ideal case. This is a 16-year-old. You can see how, even, actually, she was 15. I one form that tooth is big cavity in her first molar, you know, a typical. What's the real tragedy here? You know, the real tragedy uh, in the conflict over root canals versus no root canals and cavitations and osteonecrosis and so forth. The real tragedy is a 15-year-old with a monster cavity in her first molar. It's the initial caries, the penetration of the tooth by the disease that leads to everything else we've been talking about. So uh, I feel a little bit sanguine about uh, calling root canals the, tr the tragic part of this because the tragedy happened uh, much earlier and we're just picking up the pieces. Uh, day of treatment, this was a very good endodontist who treated this kid and uh, cleaned out the canals, filled him with gutta percha. Six months later, bingo, problem solved, right? Well. So, <laughs> there's lots of things wrong with this particular picture. First of all, it's not always that easy. There's uh, uh, many factors that we think we try to control, but have trouble with. I mean, look at this. Uh, this little bugger gave me about 30 minutes of trouble getting it out. And uh, if that had been a tooth that uh, we were trying to keep, um, can you imagine trying to negotiate this right angle here? And we all know that's difficult. Here's, a, here's another tooth that came out, right angle bends in the, in the canals. Here's some lucky endodontist who found uh, four canals in a lower first bicuspid. Would we even think to look for four canals in a lower first bicuspid? But these are factors that we at least uh, tell ourselves we are trying to control. And how many of these factors can really be under control. Uh, okay, well, technical difficulty. You know, there's how much uh, agonizing about uh, do you re does does your filling really seal a canal? How about the uh, the dye penetration of this gutta percha sealer versus that one, and so forth? There's a lot, you know, there's been agony about this for you know the whole history of endodontics, and then uh, more recently, everybody's realizing, well, wait a minute, it's going to leak from the saliva too. We got so there, it's not entirely easy to do this procedure. And then there's the stuff we can't control because there's no technical way to get in there and clean out all the accessory canals, fins, isthmuses, uh, lateral canals, uh, which are everywhere. Here's a cartoon from an old endo textbook. Here's a cartoon from a new endo textbook. Everybody knows it. Wouldn't it be nice to have a instead of a mechanically uh, adapted system for getting into these canals, cleaning them, filling them, wouldn't it be nice to have a diffusive system, something that you could introduce into the canals that would actually sort of spread out and, and do chemically what we can't do mechanically? Well, then in the history of endodontics, of course, there's uh, any number of toxic materials that have been introduced. Uh, and some, there, there's plenty of literature that um, substantiates this little statement. Any material placed in a root canal is going to be found in the liver pretty soon, pretty quick. The phenols, the uh, 
formaldehydes and everything. Uh, there's numerous papers that show that you, you put uh, CMCP in the root canal and uh, within an hour you can find it in the blood, within a few hours you can find it in the liver, et cetera, et cetera. Here's some of the, some of the uh, rogues gallery, some of the great ideas that people have had over time. Um, paraformaldehyde, of course, is, uh, one of, is the active ingredient in, or one of the active ingredients, uh, for all I know it's plutonium, I don't know, in uh, Sargenti paste. And uh, by George, it kills germs. But it shows up, it's, it's, uh, it shows up in the periapical tissues, it shows up in distant organs, and uh, it ain't good for you. Uh, well, okay, what else is wrong? <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're a uh, microorganism and you have uh, lots of friends with you and you have the, you have the capability of excreting proteolytic enzymes and digesting that nasty human stuff, this is the view of this is your view of the wall of your new house. Uh, this is where the uh, donoblastic layer used to be. And um, boy, it looks, uh, looks like an apartment complex. And here's another view. This is uh, the long view block of, of uh, dentin. This little guy down here is a red blood cell, so you can see the scale. You know, the bacteria are typically one tenth to one, you know, if this is seven microns, seven, eight microns, and a bacterium about one micron, they'll, they'll fall into those little holes like, uh, like balls rolling around on a game. More tubular anatomy. I never knew it until I uh, came upon this wonderful website that uh, my, uh, dental tubules had all these little helical openings, you know, it's sort of like, uh, cloud chamber particles, you know, but ever more complicated. Now we know when a, when a root canal is infected, when a tooth is infected, that the tubules fill up with microbes. And, um, you know, this is just off the, uh, the endodontic literature. This is from PubMed. You can go through all the endo journals and there are lots and lots of articles. Uh, many anaerobes, most of them are anaero of obligate anaerobes, similar to the kind of uh, bacteria that Dr. Loesch was talking about this morning. And of course, they, if you have areas of, uh, of periodontal disease and, and cementum denuded from the, from the uh, cervical area of a tooth, the tubules become an open highway between the endodontic space and the periodontal space. Uh, bacteria yeasts, uh, are also very prominent in this, in this flora. Um, more of the same, you know, there's, it's, it's endless. But then, uh, so what? <laughs> so what? I don't remember who, uh, who wrote this. This was a quote I picked up in a trade journal article by a well-known endodontic uh, lecturer, but it was a throwaway journal and I didn't keep it, so I threw it away. Um, Any bacteria remaining in the dental tubules will be permanently entombed between the sealed root canal and the cementum. The cementum is represented as a hermetic seal. And that was the word that was you know, a very nice, very well-known endodontic professor looked at me and said, I said, what about bacteria in the tubules? He said, the cementum. And I don't mean to make fun of him because he's really an excellent person. And, uh, but he did this. He said, the cementum is a hermetic seal. But it, my contention is that anything that is permanently entombed without being killed is going to be undead. and come back to get you. All right, well, what about this cementum? What about, 
Again, I was going to talk a whole lot about what cementum is to the non-dentists who are not here today. But uh, it's interesting to see how much there is in some places and how little there is in other places. Here's a tooth which obviously had some periodontal uh, involvement and the cement, there's basically no cementum in this. I don't know whether this, the battery's fading out by the way. Um, I don't know whether this is, is calculus or if it's uh, uh, remnants of tissue. Probably not remnants of tissue because this looks like it was a cleared specimen. Uh, but, you know, here's where the, the tubules become the open highway between the, the uh, who's got that other, who was fragging me with the light before? You got more batteries in your light? <laughs> anyway, uh, this is where the tubules become an open highway between the periodontal space and the endodontic space. Oh. Uh, so cementum varies in its thickness. Well, what about cementum? Here's more cementum. You can see how thick it is in this cross-section of a three-rooted tooth. Uh, primary periodontal fibers and the very, very dense cementum that it attaches to. Uh, very few papers on permeability of cementum. Uh, Again, acknowledgement that uh, root planing uh, opens the highway. And again, where it's affected by periodontal disease. Uh, I like this one. This paper was very interesting. I can't pretend to understand the math here. Uh, but this was a, a lab in Slovenia. And they used a, uh, not a terribly small molecule. It was an anthracene kind of analog that I don't know what spin labeled means, but it has something to do with, it's a magnetic molecular probe. Um, but what they showed was, uh, this is, you, you can't really see the tubules here, but here's the dental cemental junction, cementum to the outside and the periodontal space. So what they showed was that uh, the, the dentin is perfectly permeable. You know, if you put a you know, solution of these probe molecules in here and then measure them somehow or other as they, you know, as they translocate across this uh, diffusion barrier, the dentin is very permeable and they give it, it was on the order of 10 to the minus 6, okay? I don't know what 10 to the minus 6 represents, but uh, then this junction was a very severe barrier the junction between the cementum and the, and the dentin. Uh, this barrier layer here had a permeability that was called very, uh, very much like the permeability of enamel, uh, which was on the order of 10 to the minus 10. And then the balance of the cementum had a permeability on the order of 10 to the minus 8. So there was a, there is a, a firm barrier at this point, but it ain't zero. And we're talking about the fullness of time, uh, whether it's weeks or months or years after having been infected and perhaps treated with the undead living in here. Uh, and uh, their waste products, their anaerobic waste products, will eventually permeate and, uh, you know, in the language of, uh, oh. I can't remember whose language that was, but it'll fill up the periodontal ligament space and every time you bite on the tooth, it'll squish these anaerobic waste products into the bloodstream. And, uh, and why do we think there's a problem? Well, I'll tell you why I think there's a problem because, and I'm, I'm sure many of us have had this experience, if you extract a tooth that has had a root canal treatment or has been non-vital for a long time, and it's just not restorable, but it's asymptomatic, looks good on the x-ray, and you extract it, and it smells like it's been in a septic tank, I think there's a problem. I think, I think we rely on 
feels okay and looks okay on the x-ray far more than it deserves to be relied on. Well, here are the godfathers of the, uh, the uh, uh, focal infection theory from back 100 years ago. And uh, these people, Paul, yes. No, I wasn't planning on it. I wasn't planning on it. Yeah, the resistance factors that it, it uh, conveys on uh, resistant carries and so forth. But no, we're beyond that. We're already into pulp. You know, pulp's already dead. Uh, the godfathers of the, of the focal infection theory. The interesting thing about the focal infection theory is um, that it was mostly concerned with the, uh, the spread, the metastasis of uh, active infection from a primary site to, to distant sites. And of course, you know, when we talk about root canal treatments, we're actually, we're talking about uh, a situation where the infection is ostensibly treated. So it's a little different from the original focal infection theory, although one of the features of the focal infection theory could also be the spread of uh, toxic uh, materials and immunologically active materials from from the site of infection. Anyway, uh, the um, work of Weston Price has been popularized uh, in, in books by friends of ours, Bob Kulach, Tom Levy, George Meinig. Uh, and so I'm not going to really belabor it. Everybody in the room probably has heard it 75 different times. Uh, but fundamentally, the, you know, the, the landmark, the the billboard piece of work that's quoted from Dr. Price was his uh, uh, work with rabbits where he uh, implanted fragments of extracted root canal treated teeth or cell-free uh, uh, filtered um, extracts of them and these rabbits died. Um, and how dramatic that it was often from diseases similar to those of the people from whom the teeth were extracted. Um, I remember reading a, a um, Western adventure novel written sometime about 1940 in which uh, one old cowboy says to the other, no more rheumatism for me, I'm going to have all my teeth pulled. So uh, this was a this was a concept that uh, penetrated the culture to a very great extent in the golden age of focal infection theory. But um, the the evidence for it actually curing lots of diseases was perhaps a little sketchy. And then you know out comes this Cecil and Angevine paper in 1938 uh, when as a specific treatment for arthritis it just didn't seem to measure up. And um, of course, soon after that, there was the introduction of antibiotics, and uh, uh, the whole problem went away. If anybody's interested in a uh, actually pretty good, uh, fair history of the theory of focal infection, I can recommend this Hubert Newman article of the Journal of Dental Research in 1996. Uh, Now, the, the rabbit work was published in 1924, and um, you know how things go in the research environment. If the uh, people who are in charge of research are not interested in a question, well, it ain't going to get done. So this was not replicated in, in the academy, uh, although I, I do know that uh, Hal Huggins was able to, or claims to be able to, have, have been able to replicate it using guinea pigs, but not rats. And um, so the rabbits were, had problems with root canals, but the rats did not. The, you know, to have, having heard him talk about this, he said he would put the uh, pieces of root canal teeth under the skin of the rats and they wouldn't be bothered at all. They'd just 
exfoliate it, kick it out, be there on the bottom of their cage, and they'd go on about their business. Um, although he does claim that uh, guinea pigs function much more like Dr. Price's bunnies. Well, we come to the modern age. Uh, ALT is Affinity Labeling Technology. Dr. Haley's not here today. He's a stalwart culture hero of ours. Um, let me describe for the record uh, what kind of test he was using. The uh, Affinity Labeling, uh, the enzyme photo labeling test uh, is a system. It, well, he's a biochemist, and, and he invented this biochemically, biochemical tool for biochemical research. And what it is is it's a method of uh, determining if the active site of, a, of an enzyme is functional or not. And uh, if the active site of, a, of an enzyme is rendered unavailable and non-functional by some toxin, well, then it, it's an assay of, of sorts in, of toxicity. So he took, uh, uh, for this particular test, he took five common uh, glycolytic and otherwise uh, uh, energy-related enzymes and would expose them to a, uh, uh, an analog of their normal substrate that had a special ligand on it that was uh, photosensitive. You let them react, you shine the light on them, the uh, photo ligand explodes and basically staples the, uh, the substrate to the active site. Then the substrate is, is uh, P32 labeled and uh, you, can, you can find it. If the enzyme is, uh, is rendered dysfunctional, you go through this whole reaction and you can't find it because the substrate is not able to attach. So anyway. Uh, what they had, what they started doing was collecting samples of uh, extracted teeth, both uh, uh, normal undiseased teeth and teeth which had been treated, rinsing them. And I think he, you know, from his previous presentations, we know that, that he would use the third rinse and then put the third rinse into the, uh, the system with these enzymes and see to what degree they caused inhibition of attachment of the, uh, the substrate analogs. Uh, basically, it broke down this way. 25% uh, or more or so of the samples of root-treated teeth that had been extracted and sent to him, well, in his words, it was scary toxic. In other words, a very high level of inhibition of or inactivation of the active site of uh, the test enzymes. There was a big middle, moderately toxic, and about 25% of these root canal treated teeth were fundamentally not very toxic on, the, on this particular assay. Um, sir? It was a, it was a, uh, a threshold that he, he established, uh, which I can't remember about you know, percentages and so forth, but it was it was something which was not significantly different from a control. So I, w I don't think he means zero, but he thinks below a particular threshold that they established. Fifteen percent. Yeah, something that was not statistically distinguishable from a control. Maybe he would. Maybe he would. You know, when I spoke to him on the phone last month, he said 25% uh, scary toxic, 50% moderately toxic, and 25% not really. So, uh, and they also characterized many of the molecules that uh, were present in these uh, fluids. Now, when you rinse a tooth that had been extracted, basically you're, you're looking at what's outside the cementum. You're not looking at what's in the dentin. You're looking at what could be a systemic exposure because they weren't sectioning and breaking open these teeth. But sulfides, methyl mercaptan or dimethyl sulfide, other thioethers, polyamines, and then the very 
scary fungal toxin. This stuff is smelly. This is what uh, this is what you smell when you extract a tooth that smells like it's been in a septic tank for a month. And uh, these are all uh, known to be very active toxins. Well, along comes Bob Jones, who is uh, you know the inventor of the cavitat. Bob Jones is uh, very zealous in this pursuit. And he, uh, I don't know where he gets his money from, but he spent a lot of money on uh, uh, ind independent research on what those molecules can actually do. Uh, so he's, um, he got interested in these protein DNA interactions, which, uh, you know, you can hear him. <laughs> Hunch myself up a little. These are this cancer. My Bob Jones uh, impression. Anyway, uh, root canal toxins show inhibition of any protein DNA interactions. Here's a slide of his uh, talking about three particular proteins, which are uh, nuclear, which which are DNA interactors. And uh, their particular function is as a tumor suppressant, uh, controlling uh, size of cells, the growth of cells, and the uh, controlling the mass of, of a cell, and uh, regulating apoptosis. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Haley's third rinse of extracted root canal treated teeth. And uh, here is this kind of log curve of inhibition of all of these three different critical protein functions. Uh, so, you know, these, these, these chemicals are, are active. And then also when it comes to uh, what uh, Dr. McMahon was just talking about, uh, bacterial toxins, many of which are prothrombotic, uh, they're clotting factors, basically, or, or uh, pathological clotting factors, and can contribute to the process of, of forming uh, cavitations. Um, I kind of, I wonder, and I don't know anything about this, but I wonder because uh, we've interacted with bacteria and other microbes for the entire course of evolution. Uh, we must have some degree of resistance to this kind of toxicity. There must be some metabolic method uh, of, of handling this kind of exposure. And this is something that I haven't really been able to get straight with uh, these authors or with uh, uh, toxicologists that I happen to know. Um, it's, it's all very amorphous, it's, and, it, and it comes down to really that uh, rabbit-rat axis, uh, I'm, I'm certain. But anyway, these are highly active biological molecules, and they're, they're something which people have to resist uh, to go on living. But can we, um, can we do something to uh, ameliorate the exposure with our techniques? Well, there's the bottom line. You know, the root canals tend to maintain populations of microbes in the tubules if you're not disinfecting the tubules all the time, if there isn't some mechanism for doing that. And um, that is the problem. All right, well, why are there 18 million root canals done in the United States every year? You know, what could possibly be? I mean, in the light of what we do know about the, the toxicity, the potential toxicity, the real toxicity, the bad smell. Well, this is my friend Catherine, who bids you all good day. She knew she was going to be speaking today. Uh, former chiropractor's assistant, mother of a young child, uh, consumer of alternative health care services. Uh, She's the very center of the demographic of our patients. She's not a sick person. She's had a few things to deal with with time. Um, when it came to uh, tooth number 18, when it went bad, 
she had it extracted because she knew root canals are. But she didn't like that experience. And when it came to tooth number three, she opted for a root canal. And here's what she says. Here's Michelle. This is, she looks a lot better than this in real life. But um, former executive of Whole Foods Market, no, I mean uh, Wild Oats Market, and now an independent broker of organic products, person who has been a consumer of alternative health care services, um, with Catherine, the very center of the demographic of my patients anyway, uh, has some money, very well educated. Um, the educated health consumer. She had had a root canal in tooth number 12, right here. And one year she moves to California and she uh, sought out a holistic dentist. And the holistic dentist convinced her the root canals are no good for her. She's not a sick person. She's not a person who is struggling with uh, chronic fatigue or, you know, the variety of, of uh, mysterious diseases convinced her that the root canal is no good and she agreed to have the tooth extracted and have a bridge placed. And uh, so this dentist extracted tooth number 12. Look how nicely it's healed in. He must have done the, you know, the latest uh, protocols for preventing NECO formation here. Uh, did a very nice porcelain fuse to high noble gold bridge and uh, a couple years later she moves back to Boulder where I practice and she comes back to my office. She says, you know, my bridge bothers me though. So I took an x-ray and lo and behold, here's tooth number 13 with a goober on it. I said, Michelle, you need a root canal. <laughs> she says, what, what can I do? I said, well, it, it, we can extract the tooth. We can take off the bridge and extract that tooth. And she says, but I just paid $3,000 for that bridge. I says, so let's do a root canal. She says, but, but no, root canals are good, are bad for you. And she went away for six months. So this is the conundrum that, that otherwise well-educated, sophisticated healthcare consumers are, are in. What am I going to do with Michelle, you know? Michelle's not a sick person. Paul. No, that, was, that tooth had been restored previously. But, if you're going to do crown and bridge dentistry, you're going to run into pulp problems. And you have to have some way to be prepared to handle the ensuing pulp problems, or else you, have, you, you can't do crown and bridge dentistry. You have to have flexite flippers in every missing space. Um, and some people are perfectly willing to, to uh, uh, undergo that type of dentistry, and other people are not. So, uh, that's moving back to Boulder. Harsh, very harsh. All right, well, if we're gonna keep teeth with root canal treatments, then I think disinfecting the tubules has to become the standard. And uh, I think we can no longer know, you know, coming from, from, from one side of the argument, Bacteria in the tubules, so what, will no longer hold water, okay? Because we know that's not good enough. And can we do it? Well, there's, there's a pretty substantial literature on disinfecting dentin tubules. Uh, if, you know, looking through the endodontic literature, you'd think that it was the hottest topic in the world, you know, right after uh, uh, how to do it quicker. Um, the literature doesn't bear out that kind of uh, uh, gloss that you get from those who say it doesn't matter. It's either that or the endodontic graduate students really need a lot of topics to investigate. 
you know, so they can get write their theses. And I think that's who's writing a lot of these papers. There's two systems. First of all, you know, the old system of canal culture is still being used in research. What produces a higher percentage of negative cultures? And in vitro, there is uh, the system that's most frequently used is making blocks of bovine dentin, uh, sterilizing it in an autoclave, and then dropping it into a culture of, of known pathogens or suspected pathogens leaving it there for a week or a month or whatever and, and giving them plenty of time to perfuse through the tubules and then subject it to uh, irrigation or uh, other kind of uh, disinfectants. And if you start off with a dentin block that looks like, um, well, where's my red picture? That one. And you, uh, you put a disinfectant in the center, then you can uh, under sterile conditions, you carve away this layer and you culture it. Then you carve away this layer and you culture it. And then you, you know, so you can have you can get a a, a measure of uh, how deeply into the dentinal tubules the, the disinfectant actually works. Okay. Okay, that's the dentin block system. <laughs> And there's a, 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 a true plethora, which is a profusion of confusion, uh, because many of, these, uh, uh, many of these papers contradict one another. Um, first off, there's some sort of general consensus that if you, if you irrigate a canal with sodium hypochlorite for a half an hour while you instrument it, you really can only disinfect about the first 100 microns of the, uh, of the dent. Okay. And 50% of the samples were still infected with endo, with the uh, Enterococcus fecalis. Enterococcus fecalis, the bad boy. Um, calcium hydroxide, pretty good. And then, you know, depends on how you prepare it and so forth, but calcium hydroxide is uh, um, whatever, it's the go-to guy in, in uh, disinfecting dentin, but Wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe it's not so good. Hey, chlorhexidine is better, but and then uh, then what about iodine? Iodine's pretty good too. Iodine pretreatment before calcium hydroxide really knocked them down. Um, actually, it's better. Uh, now, Enterococcus fecalis is the current bad boy in endodontics. It's everybody's favorite experimental organism because it's the hardest to kill, and it is known to be one of the, fa one of the factors that uh, uh, causes recurrent infections in root canals. Uh, so now, if where are we? I got no dot. If you can. Uh, Fill a canal with calcium hydroxide, you can get the uh, pH all the way through the dentin up pretty high. But wait a minute, you need 11.5 to kill Enterococcus fecalis. It's only retarded below that. And then it grows back. It grows back. Chlorhexidine with calcium hydroxide, slightly more effective. There's another paper that, that had uh, calcium hydroxide in, in previously infected canals for two months. And uh, then there was a, a, after two months of calcium hydroxide exposure, there was a biofilm of E. fecalis on the, on the canal wall. There he is, he's back. He's bad. Okay, Siqueira, uh, who has written many of these papers uh, in Brazil, um, is of the opinion that combining calcium hydroxide with other medications enhances its antimicrobial. He's using a lot of CMCP. Uh, if you mix, if you're a ruthless endodontist and you can subject your patient's liver to CMCP, you can do a better job. CMCP better than calcium hydroxide, you know. Um, I don't know that CMCP really passes muster if you're trying to be a biological dentist and, and use only uh, reasonably biocompatible materials.
And then calcium hydroxide is either better with or without chlorhexidine. Uh, and anyway, the collagen <laughs> in dentin can sequester some of these materials and, and, and inactivate them. It, this is a mess. This is basically a, a fine mess. Here's some more methods. Sir? Yeah, there's, there's other papers that have antibody, you know, uh, uh, metronidazole in, uh, in root canals shows some promise. But again, it's some measure of diffusion through the, through the tubules, not all the way. The, the germs grow back is, is the real message here. Uh, we love ozone now, but uh, ozonated water, sonicated for 10 minutes in the canal showed just as good as hypochlorite for two minutes. Uh, this is good, though. None of the cytotoxicity. We'll talk about ozone. Uh, lasers. Got some press. Uh, the water lay is approved by the FDA for endodontic procedures. Uh, the claim is that um, there's very few papers published at this point about lasers, very few. Uh, the claim is that uh, the laser irradiation can penetrate 1,000 microns through the dentin and kill bacteria. Uh, even George Meinig is willing to say that maybe lasers will, will be good at uh, disinfecting tubules. That was a surprise to hear that. There's antibiotic treatment dressings. There's a new product just out from uh, uh, Tulsa Dental. I don't even know the name of it yet. They, but it's chlorhexidine with a surfactant, they say, is uh, more active at killing beefy callus. And of course, the ever more toxic substances that try to stay away from. I like this little guy. This, is, uh, th this was a culture, an anaerobic culture study. It's kind of a benchmark. It's just, just a method of telling us where we stand. If you, if you uh, do immediate obturation or you, you just do normal instrumentation with sodium hypochlorite for half an hour, you can get this, you know, 60% negative cultures. If you leave calcium hydroxide in there for a week, you get 90% negative cultures. So I call this the coral model because this being my first formal lecture, I've got a lot of ego to build up. And uh, so, yeah, you can, you can disinfect dentin. The more effort you put into it, the more disinfected you can get it. And there's probably an unapproachable asymptote, which, beyond which will actually satisfy George Meinig and the spirit of uh, Weston Price. Um, and if we take the... Uh, Previous the, the, the shooping paper, no dressing there. Calcium hydroxide per week gets you about there. Can you get higher on this curve? Can you can can you do that? Uh, calcium hydroxide actually is pretty good. It's got it, it, there's a number of uh, papers that show improved outcome of normal endodontics when you do a treatment dressing. Um, so I, I started doing this stuff. Calcium hydroxide powder comes from uh, uh, Sultan chemists. And betadine comes from the supermarket. And uh, so I'm combining calcium hydroxide with other medications. Um, and it, this is my treatment dressing. I call it the coral method. And if I have a model and a method, maybe somebody will name a burr kit after me, too. And I'll, I'll really have made it. Uh, here's the water lays. Water lays comes with, with the long, skinny, flexible tips. Uh, the, the skinniest is the equivalent of about a 25 or 30 file. And you, know, you, you pre-file it, and you get the water lays down there. And, um, uh, We'll see. It, you know, it's the new thing. And then if you have a little ozone generator like this one, uh, you can do the, 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 the other 
latest and greatest thing, which is uh, fill a syringe full of uh, oxygen, ozone, gas at some concentration and uh, insufflate the, uh, the root canal before you fill it. And um, among uh, IAOM team members as of last September, this has gathered a, a whole bunch of enthusiasm. And uh, uh, so I got the little ozone generator. I'm fumigating everything, you know. And we know that uh, Cavo is coming out with a, with a machine which costs 10 times as much but it, and is going to be used to um, uh, fumigate carries. And uh, this may turn out to be the new model of how to disinfect stuff in dentistry. Uh, Somebody's got to do the actual research, you know, get the bovine dentin blocks and uh, fumigate them and see how, how disinfected they get. It hasn't been done yet, but uh, we'll see. Stay tuned. Okay, well, we've uh, gone ahead and, uh, and disinfected the tubules to whatever extent we think we can. And then there comes the subject of filling the canals. Well, you know, the cork it up theory is, is the, uh, it's what everybody does, three-dimensional obturation of uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then there's the diffusive theory. The diffusive theory, uh, we think, would account for those, those uh, unreachable spaces, those microscopic spaces, the, lateral canals, the tubules, hopefully, the fins, isthmuses, et cetera. Uh, the original diffusive filling was, of course, uh, sargentic paste. So in the 1960s, in France, uh, this little product was developed, calcium oxide, the use of calcium oxide to fill root canals. Um, this was manufactured for a few decades by SPAD laboratories in France. And long about 1999, SPAD was, was bought by Densply. And um, anybody hear the, the Jaws music? <laughs> then within a year or two, they shut down BioCalyx, and then there was no more BioCalyx. But uh, quite by uh, serendipity, uh, Guy Duquet in, in Montreal was about to come out with a competing product uh, and he was there to pick up the, uh, the slack and came out with EndoCal uh, within a few months using the same exact formula as uh, you know, has previously been used for biocalyx. Here's EndoCal and there's the lentulo you use to put it in the, in the canals. All right, why calcium oxide? What's the deal about calcium oxide. Why is it biocalyx or endocal on the uh, internet and on the tongues of your patients as they come in and say, well, do you use biocalyx? And, and that's the reason. That's it right there. Calcium hydroxide does not set in a root canal. It will wash out. It will disappear after a few months. And uh, you can't claim to fill the root canal if you're just using calcium hydroxide. Uh, the calcium oxide. Uh, does set, and uh, you know it can be used as a uh, as a permanent root canal filling. And if you uh, if you add to this model uh, uh, iodine, which is a biocompatible material, to your calcium hydroxide, maybe you climb the curve a little bit. And if you fill the canal with uh, endocal, maybe you climb the curve a little bit higher. Okay, why calcium oxide? There's, there's two reactions posited for calcium oxide in a root canal. Uh, the first is this hydrolysis reaction. Calcium oxide reacts with water, becomes calcium hydroxide, and then proceeds to have whatever active effect the calcium hydroxide provides. And the second reaction is this one where the calcium oxide in water will uh, react with carbon dioxide, which is normally present in the environment, in the, in the metabolic environment, and turn to calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is limestone. So it, uh, it is capable of 
hardening and staying in place. Um, now here's a, a picture from a, a geology journal. The dissolution curve of calcium carbonate uh, by pH. So if you get calcium carbonate forming in your root canal and the infection resolves and the pH gets up to the physiological range, this stuff is perfectly insoluble. It, it stays. It just stays there. Uh, if you fill a root canal with calcium oxide and you have uh, acidic tissue fluids because the infection is still present, it's not going to set. It's going to be soluble. Even if it forms some calcium carbonate, it's not going to stay. Uh, it's, it's not going to be hard. It's going to be dissolved. If you uh, have a successful endocal root canal filling and it's hardened up and uh, a couple years later the infection reasserts itself for some reason and the pH goes down, your endocal root filling is going to soften up. And that's why you know, people who use that have encountered that, uh, that phenomenon. So I think it's a dynamic system. Uh, because you, you, can, you can get a, a root canal filling that's diffusive, that has an, act, an active ingredient, that hardens up, that fills and obturates the canal. I'm not talking about whether endodontics is good now. I'm talking about if you can do good endodontics like this. Okay, just in case you're looking at the scorecard. Uh, so it gives you feedback. It gives you feedback in the original treatment because if your infection is not resolved, it's not going to harden in the first place. And if the infection reasserts itself, it's going to soften up secondarily. And if you think you need to retreat the, the root canal, uh, and the endocal is hard, or the biocalyx from a few years ago is, is still hard, then you have to rethink whether the tooth is actually reinfected. Well, of course, the first question anybody asks is, you know, when you've got a new product is, does it work? And believe it or not, this is a question that was never adequately documented by the French after 30 years. Um, and I started a, a prospective case registry, registry a few years ago. Uh, we've got, in, in, in 2001, 2002, we registered uh, nine, 90 cases of teeth that we ascertained were successfully treated in the initial stage. In other words, well instrumented, filled to the apex, the stuff hardened up, you were satisfied you'd done a good job, then registered the case. Okay? This is not ones with broken instruments and inadequate instrumentation and couldn't get to the apex and stuff. These were the good, good treatments, satisfying, did a good job dentistry, uh, and then we registered 90 cases, and I think there's four offices that participated in this. And right now, the three-year data is coming in. The three-year data is embarrassing because there aren't any failures. And I'm hoping for a failure because it's got to look real. All right, and then the question is not as root, are root canals good for you, but can we at least do good root canals with calcium oxide? Good root canals in endodontics means it's comfortable, it's functional, and it looks okay on the x-ray. And that, the those are the classic criteria of success in endodontics. Well, 2001, 2004. Looks pretty good, huh? You can really see that filling. <laughs> 2001. 2004. Not number 19, that's ick. It's this one. 2001. 2004. Well, I don't want to belabor it. I could go on all day. I've got hundreds of these cases. Uh, this is not in the study. This was well before, but I just want to show you this one. My favorite. This is the case that convinced me that uh, I was not going down the garden path. Uh, 
lower molar with a huge perioendo uh, combination lesion. You could probe to the kneecaps, uh, pus everywhere. Day of treatment, six months later. And that's, that was biocalyx. And uh, by George, it worked. Well, uh, this is the bugaboo. This is what, uh, this is what the endodontists uh, pull out and shoot us with. And uh, I, in turn, would like to shoot the guy who translated the French papers with this word. Because, uh, yeah, the calcium oxide will fill up a water layer, but it does not generate pressure. Uh, I, if I were translating this and I knew what was going to happen politically over the next 30 years, I would have said, um, I would have said uh, pervasive or uh, penetrating or something else. Because they hear expansive and they say, well, it's going to break the roots. And here's a, here's a little paper published um, last year, somebody else's master's thesis. Endocal 10 sealed roots. Well, this is not the title, but uh, he did ascertain that, that the endocal 10 treatment uh, was a good sealer. That's the first time anybody's ever done that with, with this stuff. They, they must really be searching for topics because they're so uninterested in calcium oxide as a clinical root filler. <laughs> but, you know, okay, you need a topic. Try this stuff. And they did a dye perfusion thing with 15 roots. And they all, they all were very good as, as uh, a preventive of dye penetration. But three of them fractured. And they were examined micro, you know, in a, in a uh, uh, dissecting microscope and, and, and saw fractures in three roots. No, this was, uh, this was endocal 10 as according to manufacturer's instructions. Oh, it is, and it's mixed with the liquid that's provided, which is a uh, glycol that is, uh, it, you know, it's a limited water type of thing. How do they know they were not correct Calling him a liar? I don't know. They didn't say. Well, I'll show you a fractured root. You take any, canal, any root and you fill it with calcium oxide and you leave it dry on the bench and it's going to fracture. 100%. Uh, and the reason is it's so desiccating, it is so avid for water, that it, this root was filled two weeks ago, and I took this picture on uh, Wednesday, and I just went, boink, and flaked it apart. But they don't break roots in real life. And... Um, uh, I've been doing it for 10 years. Guy Duquet's been doing it for 30 years. Uh, many people in this room have been doing, using biocalyx, using endocal. We know it does not fracture roots in vivo. And um, the thing that really cheeses me off, I have to say, is every time there's a paper like this comes out, I write to the principal investigator or the, you know, the the, the principal contact and say, why don't you guys please, please, please talk to those of us clinicians who are using this stuff and have a, an understanding of how it works and let us work with you. And do I ever hear back? No, they don't call, they don't write. Okay, well, there's some peculiarities. Now, I want to get into a little technique section. Uh, there's some peculiarities of filling the canals with calcium oxide. Uh, first of all, you know, it's a lentulo placed paste filler. So you got to make a wide canal preparation. You, you know, the original French papers dreamed about the no preparation root canal where you just kind of go and you place in the calcium oxide and it perfuses everywhere. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm sure Pierre Bernard had some success with it. Uh, personally, I like a wide canal preparation because I like to have a root canal filling that goes to the apex. Call me sentimental. Uh, 
because, <laughs> see a little squiggly line down there? I'm bearing my soul to my good friends. Now, the other reason to make a wide canal preparation is because the more calcium oxide you get in that canal, the more is going to be available to perfuse through the whole body of dentin. And uh, here's a couple of my favorite papers. Uh, this, this fellow, Esberar, these, these were uh, endodontic students at University of Texas. Uh, Esberar, what he did was he took some extracted teeth and he filled some of them with calcium hydroxide pastes that is pulped in, uh, calcium hydroxide powder suspended in water, and then they measured the pH at the cemental surface of the tooth, and he found that it raised the pH and it stayed high. And, it, um, and then what he did is he took this, you know, another set of extracted teeth and he, he condensed gutta percha into these calcium hydroxide pastes. He used calcium hydroxide sealers uh, such as, uh, I don't know, what's a calcium hydroxide sealer? Uh, Celopex, for example, and a couple others. And uh, uh, by condensing the calcium hydro condensing the gutta percha into it, you squish out all the paste, and there's a very small amount of calcium hydroxide left there, and it didn't do anything to increase the pH in the dent. Okay, and then a few years later, this fellow Mignana uh, demonstrated the same effect with calcium oxide. Okay, so you need a bunch of it in the canal in order to do the job. So therefore, don't use it as a gutta purchase sealer because endocal, you know, first of all, you're defeating the purpose. And second of all, other stuff works a lot better. This is not creamy. This is not easy to condense gutta percha into. So you're going to use gutta percha, use Celopex or something like that. Okay, second uh, issue is, is irrigation. Uh, you know, I don't have a particular program or, or uh, I don't have a, a feeling one way or another about what you irrigate with. It's peroxide, is it hypochlorite, is it? But you've got to minimize the EDTA, and the reason is the EDTA will sequester the calcium and absolutely prevent your calcium oxide filling from setting. That's, that's the whole reason. If you use a lot of EDTA in the canal, you're going to get some up in the tubules, and then it'll sponge back out. And uh, uh, I think if you use EDTA, get it in there, get it out of there. And by the way, the, uh, the calcium oxide also will, will dissolve the smear layer. So you don't have to worry too much about the smear layer uh, when you're using this stuff. Now here's something that uh, Dennis called me because uh, you know I'm here, the endodontic chairman of IAOMT. And uh, they know me at Biodent where they sell endocal. And these dentists call up, and they got, they got trouble with their endocal fillings. And um, many of them don't do this. Uh, I'm really sorry to tell you that, that it, calcium oxide root canal fillers are not suitable for one visit endo. It's just you, you can't do it. If you're going to do one visit endo, Talk to Steve Buchanan. If you're going to use calcium oxide, you cannot do one visit endo. You've got to get the patient back in a, a week or two weeks, not terribly time critical. Just make sure the stuff is hardened. And the way you do it, oops, am I missing one? There. I like to take a stiff old 35 headstrom and <laughs> stick it into that canal orifice and uh, if it's not set, it'll just fall right through. It'll be like a calcium hydroxide paste. And if it's resistant, well, good. Then it's done its job. And you, you know, proceed with the, res with the restorative. Uh, well, this is the coral method. I look forward to my burr block, too, my burr kit. Uh, when there's a vital case, you do your instrumentation. You can fill it with endocal because you don't have massively infected tubules. And uh, you wait a week or two, check to make sure it's set. If it's set, you. I don't, uh, I, I don't schedule the crown at this appointment because 
I just feel like I need to know that the stuff is set before I proceed with a permanent restoration. Or, you know, if you got a hole in an old crown and you're doing an access filling, you can do it right there. Non-vital cases, whether they're overtly infected or not, they are infected. They're all infected. So I do a treatment dressing. I do that uh, calcium hydroxide mixed with betadine. You know, uh, all that literature seems to indicate that if you mix calcium hydroxide with something, you're going to have more of an effect. And betadine, at least, is a uh, uh, reasonably compatible material. Yes? That's the, that's the theory. Maybe so. Or maybe the reverse. I don't know. You know, there's uh, endless PhD opportunities. There's probably 10 or 15 or 20 PhDs waiting to be, waiting to be claimed doing research on, on this kind of endodontics. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll retire and get a PhD in endodontics or something like that. But uh, yes. Yes, there is. Actually, there's uh, uh, one of the very few actual good scientific studies having to do with, uh, uh, with biocalyx was a, uh, a French woman's PhD thesis, uh, Martine Guigon. And she, uh, again, extracted teeth. She filled them with, uh, with biocalyx and found uh, translocation of calcium. Uh, well, it varied, but it pretty well got all the way through the tubules. John. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Uh, okay. Well, you know, sometimes uh, you check the hardness and it ain't hard and you just got to do it again. Uh, two or three times, usually most of them harden up the first time, but sometimes it takes two or even three applications. Sir? Yeah, I just rinse it out with, uh, you know, whatever you know, sterile water or whatever, and just dry it and fill it again. Yeah? The metabolic activity in the, in, in the, the normal bicarbonate, carbon dioxide tension in the uh, tissue fluids. No, the pH of an infected area, the low pH of an infected area. Here's a funny one. You know, uh, I remember in the old days, they said, don't overfill. You got to be really careful not to overfill because, boy, does it kill. And, um, you know, if you're going to do a lot of these, you're going to get some overfills. And I found that, um, you know, they, people seem to understand if they're sore a day after a root canal, so that it doesn't bother them that much. And uh, I saw this effect. I don't know. This you know, this is, I've never uh, examined this statistically or anything like that, but um, I know a few like that, you know, overfill, six months later it's gone, this stuff is gone. Here's, here's a good one. Big overfill, a year later this was, it was gone, there was pretty good calcification at the end of the root. I don't know, I tried calling this woman uh, recently, I think she moved away, I wanted to see what happened with, with that in there. But um, got to purchase this. By the way, this is an artifact of the uh, phosphor screen. But uh, you know, it's still present in the canals right to the apex, and the overfill is is taken away. What? I don't know. I think it occurs because I'm uh, making a big wide canal preparation and putting the lens low all the way to the apex, and then there's a gap where the periapical lesion is. I mean, this is taken, I mean, this picture was taken a minute after, I, you know, five minutes after we finished uh, uh, filling the case. I started doing it on purpose. I started blowing out the apex. I started trying to push it out. Um, this was last summer and this was last week. And, this doesn't look, I don't know, this is a lot of uh, 
new calcification in here. We'll see what this looks like in a year if this remodels into a more normal looking appearance. This is interesting. Uh, this may be a part of the reason why uh, you get a good, a good response to uh, periapical lesions by overfilling them with endocal. Uh, you know, anytime there's a periapical lesion, there is a biofilm of pathological organisms on the external surface of the root. And, uh, you know, it could be that, you know, the external surface of the root here is, is perfectly infected at this point. And maybe I'm getting some active disinfectant out there. You know, the, one of the, the, the main reason for a failure to, to, uh, to really heal in is, uh, is the persistence of the biofilm on the external surface of the root. Uh, here's one, radio opacity. Anybody remember what uh, biocalyx used to look like? Not this one. <laughs> uh, what you see in this root, this was a retreatment done in 1994, a tooth that was chronically, uh, you know, chronically inflamed, chronically uncomfortable. This is uh, remnants of the gutta percha that you still see in there. This picture was taken in 2002. Uh, looks, looks good. Looks good. It's been perfectly comfortable. It's been a great, you know, clinical success story for uh, biocalyx root canals, but who would believe she had a root canal? So I started looking for stuff that would make uh, biocalyx more radio opaque. Uh, and uh, zinc, ox zinc oxide is what was mixed with calcium oxide in the original formula. Uh, you can't see it too much on the x-ray. Bismuth oxide, boy, that stuff you can see. That is very radiodense, more so than barium sulfate. So why not barium sulfate? Well, you know, we're trying to stick with, uh, we're trying to be high-touch biocompatible dentists here. Uh, all barium compounds are toxic except for barium sulfate only by reason of its extreme insolubility. And, uh, you know, many of us, well, many of us try to stay away from root canals, but, you know, many of us try to stay away from barium if possible. So I said, ah, oh, forget barium. But I tried bismuth, you know, less toxic. But uh, turns out in the, uh, <laughs> in the handbook of chemistry and physics, bismuth oxide is slightly soluble in mild alkaline conditions, which is what we're trying to... Uh, um, trying to achieve, so <laughs> you mix bismuth oxide in with uh, biocalyx, and boy, you could see it on an x-ray like anybody's business, but within a day, <laughs> whoops, good thing that thing was gonna be covered with a full coverage porcelain fused to metal crown. Uh, so I hit on yttrium oxide. Yttrium is, you know, in the, in the uh, uh, microfilled composites, microfilled composites uh, are, uh, are radio opaque, are moderately radio opaque because they have uh, yttrium or ytterbium or you know, these rare earth elements. So I hit upon yttrium oxide and I have a, uh, one of my patients is the medical director of the uh, Rocky Mountain Poison Control Center and he provides me with all the inside dope on toxicity and so forth. So he sent me the, um, the, the reference on uh, yttrium and other uh, uh, lanthanide rare earth elements. And you know what? They don't have any kind of toxic profile. It's, it's like, well, uh, somebody had a, somebody put some yttrium oxide on their pizza thinking it was flour and then they, the whole family ate it and nothing happened. And that's the whole literature on toxicity of yttrium. Uh, well, I went ahead and did all the FDA paperwork. Uh, in the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, yttrium oxide has virtually identical physical properties to zinc oxide. In other words, almost insoluble in water. It's uh, slightly soluble in, in mild acids, which is uh, not what we're trying to achieve with calcium oxide. And uh, hey, you know, I got it done. And I. Uh, Got the uh, 
uh, an approval for, the, for changing the formula from calcium oxide mixed with zinc oxide to calcium oxide mixed with yttrium oxide. That's what it looks like. And you saw from the three-year pictures, it doesn't go away. You can, you know, you can see it three years later. It's still there. Yes, Paul? No. No, it's not. And I'll tell you why. But first, I got to tell you, in uh, the Quebec, Montreal, it is damn hard to get a bad meal in Montreal. It's just like going to France. It was really wonderful. So here's uh, a year and a half ago, we took a vacation to eastern Canada. And uh, that's me looking very intense there. Bunch of kids, some of them are mine. Here's Simone uh, uh, Duquet, Guy's son, who's the general director of uh, BioDent. Here's uh, Alain Renault, who's the chemist whose uh, uh, cosmetics factory has the, uh, the endocal factory set up in it. And here's Guy Duquet, uh, not quite the one who, in, who uh, introduced BioCalyx to North America 30 years ago, but second in line. And we discussed many weighty topics. We had a really great talk, a great meal, and uh, many things came up. But the main thing on my mind was uh, radio opacity. Because uh, back in, uh, in Calgary, two and a half years ago, I handed him the FDA paperwork for uh, manufacturing, uh, for, you know, for entitling us to manufacture uh, endocal with that yttrium formula. And uh, he offered me a piece of the action. And I, I said, nope, I don't want a financial interest in your company because I want to be able to stand in front of the IAOMT with a straight face and say I have no financial interest in it. And, uh, and I don't. Uh, but he hasn't made up his mind yet about whether or not to, to add yttrium to endocal. And many of us have used it because I packaged up some and sent it around. And uh, it works, doesn't it? And then you can, and you can see it on the x-ray. Doesn't impede the, uh, the set of the filling. Doesn't work any different. And uh, so if anybody has an interest in using endocal and wants to be able to see it on your x-rays, uh, now you know you've got to call up Guy at Biodent and tell him to make up his mind. And if you're watching this on DVD, Guy, uh, salut. Well, do you remember, did you use Biocalyx? Okay. Uh, Biocalyx was sold with an additional little bottle of zinc oxide. And the instructions were, uh, under certain circumstances, you could mix in a, as much as another third of zinc oxide into the, into the biocalyx and then use that as your, as your fill. So if you use as much as a third of yttrium oxide in addition to the endocal, it's the same thing. So, um, and John, I will get to your, your question. Uh, in the model of can we disinfect the tubules, we've got uh, you know, various benchmarks and, and not a lot of research to back it up, a lot of hope, a lot of extrapolation from other research. And then there's the third axis that we really don't know how to evaluate. And the axis is the bunny to the rat to rabbit axis. How do you evaluate somebody sitting in your dental chair or your medical office who has, you know, non-vital teeth and say, well, you're probably able to tolerate this treatment or, boy, you probably are not able to tolerate this treatment. You know, this is, this is another area which needs a tremendous amount of development and research. Uh, you know, how do you predict? How do you, um, how do you triage? The other axis, the fourth dimension, of course, is time. Uh, you know, because the bad boy's back, he's going to grow back. You know, 
uh, if two months later, after your calcium oxide filling, there is a, a biofilm of, of uh, um, E. fecalis growing back on the canal walls, well, you're going to slide back down the curve. And in fact, uh, to answer your question, John, uh, many of the, of the, the teeth that uh, Dr. Haley studied uh, at ALT that were scary toxic had been filled with biocalyx and had been filled with, well, biocalyx at the time. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that, that, that I, I, I couldn't tell you because the, uh, the conditions of the individual teeth that were submitted to him were not recorded, that I, to my knowledge. So a more careful study was not done. But, uh, and, and it, it goes further. Yes, sir. Same concept as gutta percha. You know, it's the cork it up theory, and maybe it's a more effective cork, but there's no attempt there to, to uh, treat the tubules. So time's going to degrade the results of, of uh, dentin disinfection. So, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, this is what's missing, and I hope you realize that, that many of what I, much of what I said has not really been researched thoroughly, has not really been subjected to, uh, to good research. It drives me crazy, you know, the people who are in a position to, uh, to do real research, good research, are not interested in these questions. And those of us who are interested in these questions are not in a position to, uh, to do that kind of research. We thought we had a good in vivo monitoring system uh, with the Topaz test. The Topaz was a, uh, a, uh, a sample collected of gingival fluid. Two more minutes? Two more minutes, okay. And you, you put it in these reagents and you test for toxicity, you test for proteins. Didn't seem to pan out. Uh, Dr. Haley tells me he's working on a new technique for in vivo testing. Uh, doesn't do us much good to find out post-extraction if the tooth was toxic or not. You want to find out when the tooth is still in the person's mouth, is it toxic or not? Um, so then you can decide whether to extract it or retreat it or do what you want. Uh, iodine antiphoresis has been taken off the board by its uh, <laughs> primary advocate, Ron Dressler, because he's now into ozone. Um, slide provided by Phil Malika, badly infected tooth. Uh, treated for eight weeks with ozone perfusion. Something's happening here. Just not retreating the root canal, not doing anything but perfusing ozone. Um, we're all excited about ozone. We'll see what, what happens. Well, dentin can be dis disinfected, but can you maintain it? We don't know. Good endodontics can be done according to normal standard criteria. It can be done with calcium oxide fillings. The calcium oxide fillings really make a difference? Does it make endodontics good? We don't know. Uh, they grow back. And we need another method for in vivo monitoring of root toxicity after the treatment, an ongoing disinfection of roots. And maybe the ozone treatments, uh, according to Malika and Harris, are going to be the new dawn. And on back home and back to work. <laughs>